بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم سبحان الله we're in the month of Ramadan and I remember the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم's hadith he mentioned that the gatherings of dhikr that the angels they come to the gatherings of dhikr of the remembrance of Allah سبحانه وتعالى and they build a tower all the way to Allah سبحانه وتعالى where the angels they ask all the people in attendance, they ask on behalf of all the people in attendance forgiveness. So inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this a gathering of his remembrance and accept inshallah, you guys as the listeners and me and the speaker, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from saying anything that's wrong and keep us on the straight path. So subhanAllah, today's topic is husnul khuluq, like having beauty in your character. And what what other month would be best than the, than the month of Ramadan? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, بَعْدَ عَوْذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانُ الرَّجِيمِ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ A verse that many of you have heard multiple times. Allah mentions that he has prescribed prayer upon us. Just as he has prescribed prayer on the past generations, that perhaps we may gain taqwa. And just anecdotally, you guys have seen from your experience that in this month, you're just more God conscious of everything we do. You know, like when you're scrolling through social media, you make sure to avoid that which the eye shouldn't see. When you're in your car, you're trying to avoid hearing that which you shouldn't hear. And when you're with other people, you just have more of a, a mindfulness in the way you speak. You know, some things that you may have said outside of Ramadan, you prohibit your tongue from saying that during the month of Ramadan. And we can all attest to different degrees how much that taqwa is there. And what is taqwa? Sayyidina Umar, he mentions that taqwa is uh, going down a path and avoiding the thorny, the, thorny, uh, the thorny parts of the bush. In other words, being where you're supposed to be and not being where you're not supposed to be. And some people, they translate it as God consciousness. So you're in the presence not in the presence of Allah, but you, your conscious is in the presence of Allah. You remember that Allah is watching you at all times. And so all of your actions are aligned with that. And so if we're in the month of taqwa, the month where we're supposed to elevate our taqwa and do things that we normally wouldn't do, right? Our ibadah increases like so much so that people that, you know, have a hard time praying Salatul Isha at home, they come to the masjid and not only do they pray Isha, they say for 20 rakats of Salatul Tarawih. And a few hours later, they're there for Fajr prayer in the first saf, praying Salatul Fajr. And you're fasting probably not the whole entire year, maybe once or twice, but then Ramadan, 30 straight days. Cold turkey, as they say. And then you give more in charity. Some people, uh, they uh, appoint their time of zakat in the month of Ramadan for extra reward. If you go look in Mecca and Medina right now, the, it's full. It's full of Muslims that are... Uh, you know, all over the Haramain, praying, making tawaf, doing their umrah. So this month is a month where all of us increase our ibadah, even if it's the slightest bit, reading more Quran, doing things on a daily basis that we normally wouldn't do. So why not also incorporate with that good character? And I was thinking about this, like my, my journey to Islam, you know, and I wish somebody would have sat me down and told me a little bit more, like when you start to practice more, people start to pay attention to your character. There's like a double standard that people hold you to, right? Like once they see that, you know, you grow your beard or you put on your hijab, uh, you start to pray and you wouldn't do those things from beforehand. You know, people, they start to question you. They start to look at you and they hold you to a very high standard. So much so that if you like argue or say a bad word or do something, they won't blame you. They will blame it on a lot of times, Islam. And yes, that's from our own Muslim family members. I think many of us have seen that. Or maybe we have been a part of that where sometimes the most resistance we get once we start practicing Islam, the most resistance we get when we start practicing Islam sometimes is from our own family members. I can't tell you how many of my family members, they told me to shave my beard. I can't tell you how many. You know, now, alhamdulillah, after you know several years of having my beard, like nobody says anything and they, they respect it actually, that I didn't fold to the pressure. They respect it a lot. Um, and so it's funny that your character also becomes scrutinized. You guys can probably relate to this, right? The moment you start showing signs of Islam, your character becomes scrutinized, right? 
Now they start calling you maybe more judgmental or that you're never smiling, you're never at the family gatherings. And so subhanAllah, those of us who are practicing Islam, it's incumbent upon us to also have the best character, right? It's incumbent upon us to have the best character. And of course, we take our example from Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba Radiallahu Anhum, where Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says that he, he, he made the Prophet, he held the Prophet to an excellent standard as he says, And you, O Muhammad, surely on an, are on an excellent standard of character. And I can just go on like multiple, multiple lectures on the character of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but they would literally call him crazy, a magician, a liar, um, somebody who breaks apart families. And these are all the accusations they brought on Prophet Muhammad because he was bringing the truth. And all these accusations were just that. They were lies. They were baseless. Because before he became a prophet, he was known as as sadiq al-Ameen, the trustworthy, the honest. Even his enemies called him the trustworthy and the honest. So it's amazing. Once you bring the truth, you will have opposition. And how did our prophet deal with that opposition with the best character? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's narrated that our, our mother Aisha, radiallahu anha, she narrates in a hadith that verily the most complete of believers in faith are those with the best character and those who are most kind to their families. And man, this is something that I continuously try to work on myself. Is a lot of times people think I'm very nice. Like when I meet people uh, outside of my immediate family, and my, you know, my sisters or my, my brother, cousins and stuff, you know, I'm, you're very cordial with the people of the masjid, at school, at work. But then when it comes to our own family, a lot of times this is where our weaknesses show up. Why? Because we're most vulnerable with our families. We're with them the most. They see all of our deficiencies. So look what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi says, that the best of those in faith and the best in character are those who are most kind to their families. So, Ajib, right? Like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he really tests us and makes us reflect upon those who are nearest to us. And another hadith he mentions that none of you are, are true in your faith, your iman, until your uh, neighbors are safe from your harm, right? Whether that's being really loud or leaving dust in their way or whatever the case may be. The Prophet always, he reminded us that those, the best of you are those who are best of those around you. It, re it reminds me of a story. This is off topic, but let me just tell the story quickly. You guys know about the story of Zayd ibn Haritha. He was a, a, for lack of a better term, he was a servant that was gifted from his wife Khadija to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in those times they had servants and you were like, you know, it, it, was, a, it was a type of like, um, uh, servitude that they had to be with their master. So the Prophet ﷺ, he had a, a servant boy. His name was Zayd ibn Haritha. Zayd was basically taken in a very wrong way. He was stolen from his family, from a tribe outside of the Quraysh. He was brought to Mecca forcefully. The Prophet ﷺ didn't know all this, right? This is the Zayd story, but he ended up in the hands of Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. So when there was a congregation from an outside tribe that came into Mecca, Zayd noticed that this is what my, my tribe, this is what they dress like, subhanAllah. And uh, Zayd realized that his family might be in the vicinity of the Haram, of the Kaaba. So he went to tell Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, this is my family, they might be here. Uh, send the word and maybe they might come looking for me. So eventually Zayd's father and uncle Realize that Zayd has been captive and he was brought here as a servant of Muhammad. So they came to the Prophet. Well, he wasn't a prophet at that time. This was before his prophethood. They came to uh, the messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They said, oh, Muhammad, we know you have a good reputation in this community. This is our son, Zayd. He was taken wrongfully from us and we'll pay you whatever you like. Just free our, our, our son. So what did our, our messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, do? He said, you know what? I'll do something better. I'll bring Zayd out. I'll bring him into the public square and we'll ask him who he wants to go home with. And if he chooses you, then um, you can take him for free. You don't have to pay me anything. So they bring Zayd. He goes and greets his uncle and his father. He hasn't seen them in many, many days, many months. 
And Rasulullah gives Zayd the challenge. He says, Zayd, this is your father and your uncle. Obviously, they came from a long way. If you want to go back with them, you can go. But if you want to stay with me, you're welcome to stay. So, you know, Zayd is there looking back and forth. His, his blood, his, his father and his uncle, and then his, his master, essentially, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa there. He looks to his father and uncle. He looks to the prophet and he says, uh, he says, you know, oh Muhammad, if they were to give me the treasures of this world, I wouldn't leave your side. So, <laughs> subhanAllah, he chose servitude to the prophet, he, who wasn't even a prophet back then, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, over going back with his father and his uncle. And Prophet Muhammad was so happy, he went to the Kaaba and he made a declaration. He said, from now on, Zayd is my son. And whatever I get, he, he will inherit. And whatever he gets, I will inherit. And later on, this was, uh, you know, and the, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed that this is not permissible. He can't be your physical, like, son. But, you know, he can be, you know, somebody in your family, but not your son. That's another story. But subhanAllah, that goes to show you what kind of personality the Prophet had that this man, Zayd, who's o the only Sahabi, by the way, mentioned by name in the Quran, chose to be a servant rather than to be a free person going back home with his father and his uncle. What kind of person and personality would that have to be? So that just goes to show you guys, and there's many ahadith. I wanted to mention some of these hadith about good character before we talk about how we can develop our character, inshallah. It's narrated in a hadith by Abu Darda, anhu, that the Prophet sallallahu said, nothing is heavier upon the scale, nothing is heavier upon the scale on the, uh, on, of a believer on the day of resurrection than his good character. Verily, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates vo the vulgar and obscene. So that which is weighty on your scale, nothing is heavier than good character. And reported by Jabir ibn Samura radiallahu anhu that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Verily, obscenity and immorality are not part of Islam. Verily, the best of people in Islam are those with the best of character. Khiyarukum ahasinukum akhlaqa. The best of you are the best of good character. And shall I tell you more? Abdullah ibn Amr radiallahu anhu said, shall I, shall I tell you about the most beloved to me and the closest to my assembly on the day of resurrection? The Prophet mentioned those with the best character. So there's countless ahadith that talks about what is character, what is good character. And the Prophet وسلم, is a shining example and many of the Sahaba as well. And this is the month where we should practice it more. The reward for it is double. And to go against good character is double the sin, if not more, right? Because this is the month that we should be exercising the most patience, the most virtue, the most smiling. And we will talk about what are some of those good practices, inshallah. In this month of Ramadan, where we're building our taqwa, why not also increase in our good character? And how do we do those things? We simply start off with the small things. Just as we're learning to read Quran and pray, we start off very slowly. Also, there are some low-hanging fruit from the Prophet Wasallam that we should practice as much as possible. What are some of those things that the Prophet did to increase his good character? One of those things is he smiled. They said that the Prophet was Bassam and Dahakan. He was always smiling, always laughing and good character. So much so that whenever he had a sour or sad face, they would ask him right away, Ya Rasulullah, what is wrong? And oftentimes he was sad because there was something about the Ummah or the Muslims that he was really sad about. You know, it wasn't, it was almost never about his own personal life. It was sometimes, but almost, it was always about the Ummah. And so he would smile a lot. When he enters the house, he would smile towards his, his children, you know, his women folk. Uh, other people in the in the gathering, I mentioned last time I was here that everybody around the Prophet thought that they were the most important. Everyone around the Prophet thought that they were the most important. And smiling is a sadaqah. Smiling is a sadaqah. What else can we do during this month? Buy gifts. Buying gifts is really important. Especially the Prophet mentioned, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the best gift you can give is that to your family. The reward is so tremendous. So whether that's, you know, getting something small like flowers or getting toys, things like that, getting gifts, it's not even the gift itself. It's the meaning behind it. And so that's something that we should do for our, our mothers, our fathers, our siblings, our cousins, whatever the case may be, our friends.
try to go out of your way to give gifts. And a lot of times, like, we have to break that religious stigma sometimes of us not being uh, social a lot of times because people that practice Islam, sometimes when you know something is wrong, you don't want to be around people that do the wrong, right? You don't, it, it's something that doesn't sit well with you. But you also have to go out of your way and know that these people that you are, that's part of your tribe, your qawm, that you have to give da'wah to them. Allah might put you in that situation so you can increase their iman. So you can increase their iman. What else can you do? To do matawajjah. Matawajjah is something that the Prophet ﷺ did often. He would turn his full attention towards a person when he would speak. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, when you're talking to somebody, give them your full respect. Try not to look at your phone to the best of your ability. Try not to be texting while talking, turning your body a certain way. Give your full attention. This is part of husnul khuluq. This is part of the best character. Doing favors for others, right? Before you go to your parents' house, before you go to a gathering, ask, what can I bring? What can I do? And if they say no, you bring it anyways, right? Do favors for people. You know, if somebody is sick, go get the medicine. They're, bring them food, you know? And this is something that the Prophet ﷺ would do often. Not only that, he would ask for favors. This is kind of a strange one. Ask for favors and show an immense amount of gratitude. The Prophet said that one who doesn't thank people is, has not thanked Allah. One who has not thanked people has not thanked Allah. And we learned, I learned in my psychology class at Davis, uh, this is like a, a social psychology class. We learned something very interesting that when you ask people to do favors, they end up liking you more. When you ask people to do favors, they end up liking you more. And the way our professor explained it is there's a cognitive dissonance that happens in the mind of the person that's doing the favor. They're telling themselves, I must be doing this favor because this person is worth it. I must be doing this favor because this person is worth my time and my energy to do it. And so there's a psychology behind it. And the Prophet, if you see from the seerah, he would ask for favors because he was a leader. And of course, he had the status uh, to be able to ask. And if, if you guys know this, when somebody who you really respect and love asks you for a favor, it's like an honor for you. It's like something like you were more than happy to do it for that person because you see that person with such love, respect, and kindness. So asking for favors, especially to those who are your subordinates, and nothing that's too harsh. Another hadith mentions during the time of Ramadan, you should be easy upon those who, you, who are your subordinates. So if you're a, a boss at your company, you take it easier on your employees. And even if you have non-Muslim employees, when they see that you're taking it easy, maybe you give them a little, you know, an hour off here and there. They come in late, they go early. These things are going to wonder, why is this person doing this in this month, right? And then that's a good time for da'wah as well. If you're a father and you're the leader of your house, if you're a mother and you're a leader of, your, uh, uh, of, the, of the house, take it easier on the kids. Maybe less chores, maybe more free time, you know? Uh, of course, around structure and whatnot, but this is something that also builds towards good kids good character, using good fragrance, right? Especially for the men without leaving the house, for the women inside the house to use good, sweet smelling smells. Uh, this is also a sadaqah. You know, sometimes we get extravagant on things. The one thing I would say to be extravagant on is cologne and perfume because it's also tied to our ibadah and smelling good is part of our husn khuluq as well. Then also the Prophet ﷺ, when he would speak, he would speak gently and clearly. Something I need to work on. Speak gently and clearly. He would avoid shouting. And his, one of, another one of his um, servants, um, Anas ibn Malik, he said, in all my years with the Prophet ﷺ, he never shouted or screamed and never said, uff to me. Another riwayah mentions, the Prophet never even said no to him. He never said no in a harsh way. And you can imagine, you know, Anas ibn Malik, I think one time he was out and playing in the market when he had to do a favor for the Prophet. The Prophet caught him playing some game with the other kids. The Prophet just smiled and said, Anas, what, what are you doing? And that's it. He just smiled at Anas. You know, a lot of times we get mad at our kids. Oh, you're making my life so difficult. Stop that. Stop this. You know, we raise our voice. We get mad at them for little things, you know, man. And it's just, um, <laughs> just reflecting on myself. I remember my... Um, you know, because a lot of things we, we learn from our own aunts and uncles and parents, they did to us, so we do to them. So we have to distinguish what's the good and what's the bad according to Quran and Sunnah. And a lot of times we get upset with the kids for doing things that kids do. 
you know, and then we don't correct it in the right way, you know. And um, I remember one advice that I got from uh, from a friend of mine. He he mentioned that he almost hardly says no to his children. So if his child asks, "Oh, Mama, Baba, can I go play outside? Can I go to the park? Can I can I do this or that?" He says, "Okay, if you do this thing, these are the outcomes of what you're doing. It could be a this consequence, b this result." And he gives the full like out, outline to his child. And he lets the child make a decision, okay? If you decide to do, play in the house and this happens, this is the consequence and you have to live with that consequence. Interesting form of parenting. You know, this is not found in the Quran and Sunnah, but it's just interesting to see that he tries not to say no as much as he can. So those are some of the do's, the smiling, the buying gifts, the facing full attention to somebody. These are part of husnul khuluq. And we see this in the character of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So what are some of the things that we should avoid? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, when asked, what, are, what is the thing that leads the majority of people to hellfire? Do you guys know what, what those two things are? Anybody know? What are the two things that lead the majority of people to hellfire? <laughs> that's good. The character is also something that's heavy on the scale, but he actually mentioned to protect what's between the... The lips and between the thighs, meaning your mouth and your privates. In other words, not to do any indecent act. And then what's tied with good character, Brother Khalid, is the tongue. The tongue is the one thing that a lot of times we end up regretting so much. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, the best friend of the Prophet, anhu, he mentioned that I never regretted something I didn't say. <laughs> I never regretted something I didn't say. And how many a times have we said something and we immediately regretted it after, right? Protecting what's between the lips and what's between the thighs is something that's really, really important, right? These are the things that can lead the most people into hellfire. The Prophet ﷺ, he, ﷺ, he mentioned that somebody will say something good. Somebody that was destined for the fire would say something good. He doesn't think much of it and it will change his destiny from the fire to Jannah. You know, think about what those things are, right? Maybe saying La ilaha illallah could be one of those things. Muhammad Rasulullah. He will say a phrase that he won't think much of, but because he said that phrase, it will lead him to Jannah. And then he also mentioned the opposite of that, the contrast of that. He said, somebody that is destined for Jannah will say something evil and vile, and he won't think much of it, but he will go, he will be thrown headlong into the fire because of that statement that came out of his mouth. Right? So it's very important that we protect our tongue because our tongue leads to our hearts. And this is another aspect of good character. And even saying little things, right? Like things that we may not deem significant. Maybe there are words, there are foul uh, names that we call our friends even. Words that we may think it's not a big deal, but in, actual, in actuality, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it could be a, a major deal, right? The Prophet said, uh, near the end of times, people would call each other by foul names. People would call each other by foul names. So this is something that we should avoid at all costs. And what are some other things that we should avoid? Obviously lying, right? Something that so, sometimes it becomes a habit just to get away from consequences, especially to my young people. You know, Allah, oftentimes we try to avoid the consequence, not realizing that the greater consequence is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So lying is something that leads to bad deeds. And then the Prophet, he mentioned our actions are connected to our faith. He said, Alaykum bisidq. Upon you, tell, it is incumbent to tell the truth. Alaykum bisidq. Right? That's what that means. It's incumbent for you to tell the truth. فَإِنَّ صِدْقَ يَهْدِي إِلَى الْبِرْ Because telling the truth leads to goodness. وَالْبِرُّ يَهْدِي إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ and goodness leads to Jannah. And then he said, um, Beware of lying. Because lying leads to wickedness. And, and wickedness leads to the fire. So our actions can have a direct impact on our character, which can have a, a direct impact on our final destination. Uh, beware of cursing as well. Cussing and cursing. Even the words like damn, right? Like damn it. Uh, a lot of when I tell my, I, I hear a lot of my, I'm a teacher. So a lot of my students, they say these words and don't think of it as any significance. The word damn is actually a form of cursing. You're asking God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to curse something. 
So be careful what you damn, right? Because it could be something that you are, you're calling upon, right? And sometimes even, I know in the Afghan culture, the Afghan parents sometimes, you know, they, they end up um, cursing their own kids sometimes, you know, and cussing out their own kids. It becomes just a matter of speech. Obviously, they don't mean it, but they're, they're invoking the wrath of Allah because they're angry, right? They don't actually want their kids to be cursed. Uh, so it's something that we should avoid at all times. And just cussing as well, using bad language, you know, uh, the, you know, the B word and the F word. And, you know, there's young kids in here, so I don't want to get into it. But you guys understand, especially, uh, you know, those of you who play sports. Anybody play sports in here? Basketball at the gym, football, anything? Yeah, you guys play? You know how it gets. It gets heated. Sometimes you miss a shot. You know, something slips out of your mouth and it shouldn't have. So it's something that we should avoid at all costs. And then arguing, argumentation. The Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned that the one who can avoid and uh, the one who can uh, avoid an argument is promised Jannah. It's so hard to not get the last word in an argument. You know, it's so hard when you want to be right and prove that you're right. You know, show that you have the might. But subhanAllah, this is the thing that ruins good character and it leaves a bad taste in people's mouth about you. If you're the religious person in the family and you're always the one arguing, what are they going to attribute that arguing to? Their religion. You see, your Islam made you this way. The moment you started growing your beard out and wearing a thob and a kufi and this and that, now, now look how much you're arguing with us. Look how much you're mis mistreating your parents and arguing with your siblings and, you know, never showing up to any family gatherings, this and that. SubhanAllah. So we got to be extra careful about arguing. Okay? And then I want to... I, I want to also mention about the treatment of the parents. The fastest way to ensure a path to hellfire is by neglecting the parents. The fastest way to ensure going to hellfire is by neglecting the parents. And vice versa, the Prophet mentioned, the, the doors of Jannah go through your parents. The doors of Jannah go through your parents. And for, for those of us who have lost parents, you know the pain that that causes, that one of your doors of Jannah are now permanently closed in this life, right? So they reopen in the next life. So subhanAllah, through our parents, our acts of our ibadah, even if our parents are not, even if they're on the wrong path, even if they don't practice Islam, right? We have countless stories of even prophets whose parents, like look at Ibrahim alayhi salam, you know, some of the scholars mentioned that it was either his father or his uncle, regardless, somebody he respects and loves, was calling him towards idolatry, worshiping stones and statues. But he said, Ya Abati, oh my beloved father, why do you call me to such wickedness when I'm calling you to the one true God, the God that created us? So even like our prophets were tested with parents that were difficult to deal with. You know, I have one friend, a very dear friend of mine, his father is going through like some, uh, you know, old age. He's losing a bit, a bit of his mental faculty and he's having a lot of difficulty because he's staying with him or he was staying with him just as of recently. He ended up going back to Afghanistan. But, um, you know, the father would just constantly lie to his son. He would lie to his son about what he did, what he was eating. You know, if he, was, he had a cigarette, he would smoke inside the room and he said, no, I wasn't doing it. And so this really tested my friend. It really tested him. But he tried to remain patient throughout. Because why? Because he was a Muslim. He knows the obligation we have. Imagine not having any faith or iman. How would a non-Muslim deal with that? Or even, even Muslims who don't know the faith, how would they deal with that situation? You know, uh, treating their father wrong, cur uh, cursing them and this and that, telling them what to do. But because of his iman and his good character, he was able to bear that with patience. It was not easy on him or his wife. You know, but uh, this is some, these are the things that we have to deal with when you have family members. Uh, and subhanAllah, sometimes your parents will push you. Sometimes they'll be your harshest critic and you'll have to bite your tongue. You know, it pains me to see that when sometimes, uh, you know, I'm in family gatherings, so I see this sometimes when parents will criticize their children and the children will then start to say two, three things back. Well, look at your own life. Look at this. Look at that. A'udhu billah min thalik. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. You know, oh, fellow sons and daughters, if your parents criticize you, take it. Take it. Okay? I want you to absorb all of that and know that every single moment of pain that you're feeling from your parents criticizing you, whether rightly or wrongly, 
Because they might be criticizing you unwrongly, right? Or unjustly, I should say. Unjustly, they might be criticizing you. Take it. Because you responding back is just making the matter a hundred times worse in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defend you. I'll tell you guys a quick story. I've been rambling so much. I want to get you guys involved. But there's a story where one of the mushrikeen and Abu Bakr al-Siddiq were arguing. Okay, they were arguing and the Prophet ﷺ was watching this from afar and that mushrik, and we're talking about Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, man. This is, this is the Abu Bakr al-Siddiq who, <laughs> who in giving in charity, right? Sayyidina Umar said, I'm going to give half my wealth for this conquest, for this campaign that's coming up. And then he wanted to know how much did Abu Bakr give? Abu Bakr gave his entire wealth, not half, his entire wealth. So Abu Bakr, he's, we gotta, Abu Bakr is a different sahabi. He's one of my favorite. Um, so he was arguing with this mushrik and the prophet was smiling. And then this mushrik began cussing him and saying the most foul things to Abu Bakr Siddiq. And the prophet began smiling and seeing this. Abu Bakr was like looking at the prophet saying, why is he smiling? This guy's like cussing me out. So then Abu Bakr, he retaliated. He started saying those things to him back to the mushrik, right? Then the Prophet ﷺ, he, his smile went away and he walked from the gathering. So obviously Abu Bakr being the person of high iman and high character that he is, he went to question, Ya Rasulullah, the man was uh, hurling all sorts of insults and you were smiling. And then when I gave him back his own medicine, you turned away and you frowned. What happened? He said, Abu Bakr, he said, Wallahi, when you were quiet, there was angels behind you getting ready to protect you from every angle. And the moment you spoke up, shaitan entered and I could not be in the same place as shaitan. Subhanallah. So imagine, these are the mushrikeen and our parents, alhamdulillah, are not mushrikeen. They may be a little misguided, sometimes a little short-tempered. They have our best interests in heart. I would say one of the best ways to improve your character are around your parents. Also during traveling, Right? Those of us who have made Umrah and have been fortunate enough to make, make Hajj or any type of traveling is also a good time to test your patience in business dealings. Right? Somebody is, uh, has the, I'm the customer, I'm always right mentality. Right? Or you're dealing with somebody who is unjust or you're trying to make a deal and you're trying to get you know, a good price on something. Remember that win-win is, is, is the most prophetic way to do a business dealing where both parties have the best outcome possible. Of course, that's not always uh, perfect. We don't live in an ideal world, but try your best. A lot of times, your business dealings is, shows your good character. They say that Indonesia and Malaysia, through the, de through the dealings of the Yemeni Muslims, through their honesty and uprightness, that whole entire region of the world converted to Islam. And now they are the most populated Muslim countries, Indonesia and Malaysia, subhanAllah. So even in our business dealings, our familial dealings, uh, and our traveling, these are the times to inculcate the good character that we learn from our sunnah, from the seerah. And um, I leave this, I leave with a challenge, okay? <laughs> I'm going to do this too. I haven't done it yet. I've done it before, but I need to reestablish this. And we should do this, you know, every year, every other year, is go to certain people in your family, okay? This is going to be hard for some of us, including me, you know, especially depending on who the family members are. I have an older sister who's one year older than me. And if anybody has a sibling close in age, and we're, we're the two oldest in our family. I, we have four siblings all together, being my older sister, you know, and we would always fight for that top position. And so we, we, growing up, we had a pretty contentious relationship. Alhamdulillah, it's much better now. But um, subhanAllah, it's still challenging, right? Because she doesn't want to be right or wrong. I don't want to be wrong. And so go to three or four of your family members and ask them, you know, oh, my wife, Oh, my brother, oh, my sister, mom, dad, tell me one thing about my character you don't like. And I'm going to try to change it this Ramadan. Tell me one thing about my character you don't like that, you, that I want to change in Ramadan. Are you guys brother and sister? Can I call you guys up here? Do an experiment? Yeah? Inshallah. Let's see if we can make this experiment. Come, come, come behind. Come over here, guys. Let's see if we can get this. This is going to be hard, man. I got to do this today, too. I don't want to be a hypocrite. I got to do what I say. Come, come, guys. So you guys are brother and sister? Come, 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 come. What's your name? Zainab. Uh, that's my daughter's name, Zainab. I love that name. And your name? Musa. Musa. Beautiful name. I don't know many Musas. That's a beautiful name. 
Okay, Zainab and Musa, you guys are brother and sister. Come, come closer, come closer. I want people to hear and see. How old are you? Ten. You're ten? And Musa, how old are you? Seven. Seven, okay. Can we do this experiment with you guys right now? Okay, let's start with Zainab. You're older, okay? So I'm going to put the responsibility on you first. Maybe turn to Musa and ask Musa, what's one thing that I can improve about my character? What's one thing I can improve about my character? Musa, think about it. Think about it. Don't be too quick. And don't be too harsh either, okay? Try to be nice. It's your sister. What's one thing? Your responsibility. Okay, okay. Your respons so you want her to be more responsible towards you in certain things? Yeah, maybe. Is that what you're saying? Is that what you're clarify for us? Yeah, in in uh, towards me. Okay. Your her responsibility towards you, okay? And now I want you to ask Zainab now. What's one thing that you want to see improve in my character? What's some one thing you want to improve in my character? You want to think about it, Zainab? You have it. Okay. Without being too harsh. Okay, be kinder. Be kinder. Okay, is that something? Let's see now. So maybe your responsibility is towards him. I don't know, maybe helping him clean up his room or something. I don't know. You can think about it. Is that something you think you can do? And what about kindness? Yes? Okay, so good job, guys. Let's give them a round of applause. You guys did a good job. You guys set the example for us as the adults and the older kids. All right, you guys can go back to your seat. Thank you guys so much. Okay, so I think if we do this when we go home, inshallah, you know, whether it be our kids and, and whatnot, uh, I, it'll be a good opportunity to reflect, you know, maybe I am, you know, I'm raising my voice too much, or maybe I'm not smiling enough. Maybe I'm not uh, listening enough. SubhanAllah, that, I remember this in the, uh, in the Taraweeh. Allah says, he sends this message to a people who listen. Qawmi yasma'oon, or yasma'oon, I believe. Um, so that's listening is such a big one, man. The Prophet was such a great listener, subhanAllah. Okay, let's go to the questions, inshallah. Um, if, there, if there are any questions, I'm not sure, but that's, that concludes the talk, subhanAllah. Uh, subhanakallahumma bihamdik, nashallah, wa la ilaha la anta, sakfiruka, natubu ilayk. Um, okay, so I start answering these questions, Brother Khalid? And we can also take from the audience as well. How can we tell someone to practice good character without telling them directly? I, I think you, a lot of people know the answer to this already by leading with good example and putting them around people with good character. There's a story of a man who killed 99 people. It's a long story and maybe we can tell it another day, maybe at a youth halaqa. But the point of this, uh, the, the end result of this man who killed 99 people, he ended up killing 100 people. This is a time before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he ended up making tawbah to Allah. He returned back to Allah. He asked for forgiveness. One of the conditions was he had to leave his town and leave the, the, the evil, the company that he was with and go to the next town. So he has a fresh start. So that tells you being around other people of good character will inculcate and engender those qualities within you. So, um, the question, once again, how can you tell someone to practice good character without telling them directly? Put them in the right environment so they see the effects of good character, I would say, and be a shining example yourself. I would say those are the things. There's probably um, a lot of other methods, but those are the two things I, I can think of. Can you explain the Quranic ayah? But only he will prosper that brings to Allah a sound heart. This related to good character. Yeah, this is the ayah of Qalb bin Salim. I'm not, I can't really comment on that. Uh, but I think just like the Qalb bin Salim, you know, I'm not going to comment on that. I, I can't, I'm not going to, um, like logically I would say it has to do with good character as well as other things like Tawheed, belief in one God and, uh, obedience to Allah and his messenger. But I'll leave that for the scholars, inshallah. Could you elaborate on the importance of patience in developing good character? SubhanAllah, patience is the thing that is really significant with, with character. And the Prophet said that not just any patience, patience at the time of calamity is the most powerful, the most rewarding. You know, I told this uh, story about the, the, the lady who, um, who basically uh, shunned the Prophet because somebody in her family had passed away and she was in a, in a state of grief and mourning. And so she shunned the Prophet when the Prophet was trying to tell her something. Later, she realized that that was the Prophet. And the Prophet, he mentioned to that lady that 
you know, the time where patience is most rewarding is a time where you're in that state of, you know, calamity. You're in the heated part of the argument. You're in the belly of the beast. You know, you're in the eye of the tornado. That's when patience will be the most. It's easy to be patient like uh, a year after, a week after, whatever the case may be. But being patient in that moment is so important. And it's something that we all need to work on. Sometimes we're more patient with others than our own family members. That's what I find with myself. It's not because I don't love my family members, because I love them even more. So sometimes your lack of patience runs thin, thin for those who you love the most. Ironic, right? That's the irony in it. Your lack of patience runs thin for those who you love more. So we got to be kind. The Prophet said that those of you that are best are best to their family, right? So we got to be really cognizant of that. Um, what role does humility play in personal growth and character building according to your perspective? Yeah, humility is a big thing. Uh, the prophet mentioned that uh, arrogance. Arrogance is thinking you're better than other people and denying the truth according to our prophet's definition of arrogance, of kibir. And he said that anybody with a mustard seed of kibir in their heart will not whiff Jannah, not enter Jannah. You won't even smell Jannah, right? So humility is the opposite of kibir, being humble. And um, my, one of my teachers in the Bay Area, Ta'ala, he mentioned that when you bring a gift to somebody, you should bring something that they don't have, right? You know, don't, don't bring something that somebody already has a lot of. Don't give them another uh, air fryer. You know, a lot of people have like three, four air fryers, you know? Bring them something that they don't have. And so when you go to the kingdom of Allah, right? Inshallah, one day we get there to the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says that, you know, bringing Allah a gift. It's a metaphor. You know, Allah doesn't need anything. He's ghani. He's free of all, uh, he, of any wants. But we can give something that Allah doesn't have. And what's that thing that Allah doesn't have? Allah doesn't have humility. Allah doesn't have humbleness. He doesn't have meekness. That's, that's not befitting of the master, the Lord, the king of kings to have meekness and mildness. He's al-mutakabbir. He is the most great, the most magnificent. So if you come to his throne with humility, right? That's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. Because Allah doesn't, that Allah, one of Allah's attributes is not being humble, right? That's not befitting of Allah to be humble. It's befitting of us to be humble. Because we are his servants and he is our master. So uh, interesting metaphor that uh, my teacher, he mentioned to us about humility. Okay, in your experience, how does temperaments play a role? Oh my God, temperaments. We're going to get into temperaments now? I, I'm not qualified to speak on, I know there's like four main temperaments. Uh, this has been written about a lot and talked about. I'm not an expert in this, but they're very interesting to read about. If you guys Google uh, temperaments, and you can even Google temperaments in Islam, there's a lot of Muslim scholars that have like done work within the temperament world. Like there's four kind of like temperament traits. And... Um, I don't know if there's more now, but last time I checked, there was four. You guys see some of the literature around that. I don't know too much about it. I just did some very light reading on it. Um, as parents, how do we help build character when there are so many external social media influences? Any books or talks on this for parents? Uh, external so social media influences. I mean, there's a lot of really good role models out there. I mean, it's our job as parents to, to try to help. Sometimes our own voices only go so far as the parents, but put, put our kids around, like I was talking to Brother Khalid about this earlier, uh, having that effect on the children. Sometimes these talks and these khutbahs, they don't always have that lasting effect, you know, that we want them to have. So being in the company of good people, for me, that's been, that's what helped me develop any ounce of good character that I have is from the, care, the, the role models that I've seen. So it started with like my Muslim friends in college who were very good role models uh, for me. And then um, my, a lot of my teachers and the people, the students of my teachers, they were very good in terms of they were on time. When they said something, they did it. They told the truth. They were kind to their parents, kind to their family members. You try to live up to that standard. And being around people who do that, if, if you, four of your friends have good character, you're going to be the fifth person with good character, right? If four of your friends have bad character and they lie, cheat, and chill, <laughs> lie, steal, and cheat, then you'll also be that fifth person to, say, to do the, those things. Uh, how can we suggest someone start praying without hurting their character? This one's hard. SubhanAllah, man. Pray around those people, honestly. I think that's the best way. I've been in that position where, like, you know, you tell somebody straight up, like, hey, you need to start praying, and it hasn't always worked well. 
Um, so I, I've, I can empathize with that. It's very difficult. Um, talking about the rewards of prayer, I know that helps often, especially when you're teaching young kids about prayer, the rewards of it, the implications of not praying. These are things at a small age that need to be told. So by the time they're older, it's already internalized within them, right? This The first thing you'll be asked about on the day of judgment is your prayer. The very first thing you'll be asked about. So when you mention all the hadith about prayer, what distinguishes the Muslim from the non-Muslim is the prayer. This is the it's an authentic hadith of the Prophet Wasallam. But this has to be done as early as possible, starting at two, three, four years old. All these hadith and these talks should be mentioned at that young age. So by the time they're seven, eight, nine, ten, it's internalized within them. That even if they're not praying, they know that they should be praying. That's a very important thing. Um, they have the best character in the world, but don't pray. And many people agree that they meet. Oh my God, that's a good point. There are a lot of people that have very good character and they pray. And then the vice versa, people that pray and have very poor character. But subhanAllah, why can't we have the best of both worlds? Why can't we point to the people with very good character and they pray? But if somebody has really good character and they're not praying, I think those people have the most soft heart to begin with, that they have good character. Those are the softest hearted people. So pray around them, bring them to lectures with you, you know, go to dinner, then go to a lecture right after about prayer, have them join along. And I'm, I'm telling you, if you put people in the right gatherings in the gatherings of dhikr like this, they're gonna change. I've seen it countless, countless, countless times. So many people who I thought, oh my God, man, this person is off the path bad. And now they themselves are scholars. They themselves are scholars. So uh, put them in the right setting. Brother Khalid, do you want to um, pass the mic around if anybody yeah. has? What do you not have that, guys, by the way, I'm not qualified at all to answer these questions. I'm not a scholar. I'm not a, even a student of knowledge. Alhamdulillah, I've been blessed to be around scholars and students of knowledge. So just Brother Najib, I'm disclaimer. Sure question. <laughs> I'm just taking notes. <laughs> You, you answer the questions, uncle, man. This is not good. So, um, uh, you mentioned about words and cussing and vanity and so on. Yes. So sometimes there are phrases. Mm. And if someone says two words of the phrase and leaves the third one <laughs> blank. I know exactly what you're saying. Considered? I know exactly. See, that's a great question. He said, uh, let me restate the question. Sometimes we say a phrase that has a bad connotation and we might leave off one of the words or we'll change one of the bad words into a lighter word like the SH word will become shoot, you know, or, you know, like things like that will change words around. Ultimately, you're giving off the same, you're giving off the same meaning, you know. I think there is something to be said about people that are trying to break a habit and they always say a really bad word and they'll change it to something better. You know, I think there's, there is some praise we can give there. Because if somebody's always used to saying the F word or the B word or any other bad word, then they try to change it because they're trying to break a habit. There is, there is some praiseworthy attribute in that. I would say that. But if it continues, you know, then it's like almost, it's the same, it's the same thing, essentially. You know, you're just trying to make it sound nicer. But the idea behind it is still there. So it's best to avoid it. 100%. The Prophet, he mentioned, I have uh, um, proof for this. The Prophet mentioned, Say something good or be quiet. Say something good or be quiet. Say something khair or liyasmut or be quiet. Okay, so this is from uh, our Prophet's advice. You guys don't need my advice. Do you have a question? Do you have a question? Other than that, I would like to say Jazakallah Khair for everybody's time. You know, the best thing about this, the best thing about this, guys, is inshallah, we're remembering Allah. A lot of people are taking naps and sleeping. Look at Brother Khalid, Brother Mansoor, and all the other leaders of this community bringing these opportunities for us to benefit from the dhikr of Allah. How many times have you mentioned Allah, the Prophet, the Sahaba, in this gathering? People are napping right now, and maybe they need that nap. I'm not saying it's bad, but look at what we're doing. We're doing something better than napping. And I... I, I sincerely thank Brother Khalid, Brother Masood, all the leaders of this community for inviting me because I also reap the reward, inshallah, Allah accepts uh, the reward of remembering Allah in this blessed month of Ramadan. That's almost halfway done, if not already halfway done. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase our good character 
and make that character a means of Jannah and a means of drinking from the hands of the Prophet and the Hawd of Kawthar and seeing the face of Allah on the day when um, you know the, the Muslims will be rejoicing in Jannah. Ameen, Ya Rabbul Alameen. Jazakallah khair.